Good morning. It's time for Bible time with Bill, and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're with us, and I uh, hope that this will be a, uh, a interesting and, uh, and, and very informative time of Bible study. We're studying in the book of uh, Galatians, and we're starting in chapter 2 today. I'm Bill Wren, and um, I'm, I'm just glad to have you with us. I pray that, uh, that you will be blessed. We, uh, we, we started two weeks ago doing this, and we got through chapter 1, and uh, it's a whole lot in this book. So I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and just as soon as we finish praying, we'll just get right, right straight into the study. So uh, pray with us. Father, Lord, we come to you today thanking you for your mercy, your grace, your love, your kindness, Father, for all that you do for us every day. Father, I realize that uh, I can do nothing without you. I'm not, uh, I'm not smart enough or, or don't have the insight to, to teach this wonderful book except the Holy Spirit be with me and guide me and teach through me. So bless us today, Father, I pray. Bless thee. Study, bless those who have joined us, and uh, just get honor and glory out of everything we do and say today. For we ask it and say it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get into the study today, uh, just, just to go back just a little bit, Paul started in chapter 1 uh, uh, because of the Judaizers that had come in, into the churches in Galatia and tried to prove that uh, that he was not actually an apostle, he wasn't qualified to be an apostle, that uh, that he was teaching them falsehood, that they were, he was teaching them that they could be saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, and they were telling them that they had to keep the law, and if they didn't keep the law, they couldn't be saved. So Paul started out, uh, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. He started out proclaiming that he was truly an apostle and that he had been made an apostle, not by any man, but by God himself. So he goes on as, as he's here in chapter 1. He is uh, telling them that the gospel that he did teach them was the absolute gospel, that there's none other. As a matter of fact, he said... But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. That word accursed means damned. So Paul was adamant about this. He said, me or even an angel or anyone else come to you and try to teach you some other gospel than that which we have already preached to you, let him be damned. And uh, that's, that's strong language. And uh, he says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel than you, than that we have preached, let him be accursed. Last week, as I got started in the lesson, I said that uh, I would be going into Timothy and reading a verse there that I thought was very important. And uh, then I got caught up in the teaching and, and, and failed to go to Timothy at all and bring you that verse of Scripture. It's a verse of scripture that we all know. It's just not something that uh, that is uh, uh, new to any of us. <clears throat> the scripture that I'm thinking about is the scripture where, uh, well, I get in Timothy, I'll do better. I was in Hebrews. It's the scripture where Paul says that we're to study to show ourselves approved. Now, before I even read the rest of that verse of Scripture, I want to explain something to you that almost every cult that uses the Bible for a base is started because men do not rightly divide the word of truth. The, the Bible is not hard to understand if we study it and if we let the Holy Spirit guide us, but it's actually a very complex book as well. It has to be rightly divided. You can take verses of the Scripture and prove anything that you want to. I can tell you that you ought to go out and hang yourself and you ought to do it right away because the Bible says 
that Judas went out and hanged himself. Another verse of Scripture says, Go ye therefore and do likewise. Another verse of Scripture says, Whatsoever thou doest, do quickly. Well, you put those three together and you can kind of prove that somebody ought to go out and hang themselves, but you've taken them all out of context. And when we take verses out of context, we lose the true meaning of what is being said. Uh, it's so important, so very important. Listen, listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself. Uh, the individual, you, me, study to show thyself approved unto God. Not approved unto man, but approved unto God. We want to study so that God will approve of us and approve of our teaching. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So many times that we get up and we say things that later... Someone comes to us and says, you, you shouldn't have said what you said. And they have scripture to back it up. And they, they, they tell us, you know, they, you know, we become ashamed because we didn't study. We didn't know that. So here's the point I'm trying to make. It says, study to show thyself not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth. That word divided in the Greek means to cut straight, to cut in a straight line. There's no variance. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. We can't make it say what we want to. We must study and say what the Word of God says, the way it says it, so that we will be teaching our people the truth. So Paul says, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, you say, well, I don't understand that. Well, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. We need to separate between them. There's law and grace. Law was given to the Jews uh, because they had never known anything that would restrain them until the law was given. So they were down in Egypt. They were worshiping idols. They were doing all the things the Egyptians were doing. And they came out of Egypt. They were still doing that. And because they didn't have the law, the Bible says that at one time God sort of winked at this. And not, not that he approved of it, but he didn't bring judgment against them immediately because they didn't know any better. So God gave the law to Moses to prove to the Jews, to the Hebrews, the word Hebrew means he that crosses over, and he gave the law to show the Hebrews that they were sinners, that they were not righteous. The Bible says that where there is no law, there is no transgression. God gave the law to show them their transgressions. Now, the law has not been done away with. The law is still relevant today. Jesus didn't say, I come to destroy the law. He said, I do not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The reason for that is, is that nobody could. The only person that has ever been in this world that could fulfill the law is Jesus. Jesus came to fulfill the law so that he could be the righteousness of God and as the righteousness of God he could die for our sins he could go to the cross and die for our sins we cannot put the law and grace together it's like oil and water it don't mix for me to tell you today that you need to receive Christ as your personal savior you need to to know that he died on the cross for you, you need to ask for forgiveness and receive him into your heart as your personal Savior, but you also must keep the law. You must adhere to the Ten Commandments, to the law of God. That is mixing law and grace. There is no mixing law and grace. You cannot mix law and grace. The law was given that every man might become guilty before God. 
grace was given that all those who would believe and receive might become righteous before God. There is no mixing. You can't be half righteous or half lost. You're either lost or you're saved. You're either a sinner or you're, you're a saint. It, it, there is no mixing it together. So Paul, as he comes into the second chapter of Galatians, uh, it starts out, then 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem. Let me explain that, that Paul, when he was saved on the road to Damascus, he was there in Damascus, and, and after, he was saved, after he was saved in Damascus, he began to preach and teach, and, and then he went up to Jerusalem to visit with James, Peter and James, and he's the only two that they even spoke to up there on that trail. And uh, it says, then after 14 years, I went to uh, went again to Jerusalem. See, after Paul was saved, the Lord took him, and the Holy Spirit led him out into the deserts of Arabia. And in Arabia, the Lord taught Paul the truth of the gospel. He taught him things that that the disciples did not know. Uh Peter himself said in, in some things they're hard to understand, talking about Paul's teaching, because Paul was taught of God himself. And so he went into the desert of Arabia. He was there with the Lord for three years. Then he left there, and he went back to Damascus, and he left Damascus, and he went back to Tarsus, and he was in Tarsus for 11 years. So 11 and 3 is 14 so this is what happened before verse 2. It says, Then, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. <coughs> Paul was on his way up to Jerusalem to talk to the disciples about what God had been doing through him for the Gentiles. Titus was a Gentile. So Barnabas and Paul took Titus with them. Why? Why? Because Titus could be a real example of the grace of God to the Gentiles. So he says, Barnabas, uh, and, and, and took Titus with me also. And I went up to re by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So Paul says he went up by revelation. What does that mean? It means that he didn't go up. He didn't just decide to go up. Barnabas didn't talk him into going up. Titus didn't talk him into going up. He didn't receive a letter from Jerusalem asking him to go up. God himself put it in Paul's heart. He said, I went up by revelation. In other words, that God himself revealed to Paul that he needed to go to Jerusalem. So when God spoke to Paul's heart and he knew that God wanted him to go up to Jerusalem. It says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached unto the Gentiles. So he has Titus there with him as proof that the gospel has reached the Gentiles. And also, he says, I communicated unto them that gospel which I preached to the Gentiles. What gospel was that? That was the gospel that God himself gave Paul in the deserts of Arabia while he was teaching him after his conversion on the road to Damascus. So he says, And I, I communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. This part of this verse of scripture here is sometimes misunderstood. I may even be misunderstanding it myself. I do not believe so. Paul said that he did this privately uh, with those of reputation, that, that those that he talked with there in, in Jerusalem, he did it privately so that uh, he wouldn't have run in vain. What's he talking about? Well, one of the one of the commentators that I love to read after and I have the most highest respect for, therefore I'm not going to even tell you what his name is, but I'm going to read directly out of his book, okay? This is what he wrote, and he's a very, very...
very highly regarded uh, commentator, and you may even recognize his writing if you've read after him, but he said this, Paul recognized that if he were preaching a different gospel from what the other apostles were preaching, there was something radically wrong. Paul was willing to admit if I were preaching a different gospel, I would be wrong. I have run in vain. I have certainly been disillusioned and misinformed. So he goes to Jerusalem and communicates that gospel to the apostles there. Problem. The, what this commentator writes is that Paul wanted to talk to them in private in case Paul was preaching something wrong. That's just not true. Paul communicated to them in private so that if there was a difference, he could explain to them what God himself had taught him in the Arabian Desert. Listen to what Paul says. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man, any man, Peter, Paul, James, any man, any other man, listen, as we said before, if, as I say again now, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached, let him be accursed. Why? Why could Paul say this with such power and such certainty? Verse 11 and verse 12, But I, Paul, certify, guarantee you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Paul said, I didn't learn what I preached to the Gentiles from any man, any man. But I guarantee you, brethren, that the gospel which I preached uh, was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man. Paul said, I didn't receive any of it from a man. He's not up there talking to James and Peter trying to be sure he's teaching the truth. No, no, no. He said, for I never received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I was taught my gospel that I preach by revelation from Jesus Christ himself. He did not need to meet with any man to be sure that he was preaching the truth. If he was not preaching the truth, then Jesus himself taught Paul wrong. We know that's not true. So he says, I met with him in private in case there was a difference in what we were teaching and I could share with them what Jesus had taught me. Otherwise, had we done this in a group of people, in the open, in the public, it could have caused a great deal of trouble for the church there in, in Jerusalem. It could have also caused problems with Paul because people would side up. I believe Paul. I believe Peter and James. Paul said, I didn't want to do this. Least I had run in vain. I didn't want to do anything to hurt the gospel. Verse 3, but neither Titus, a Gentile, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul said, after I told them what I had told them, even though Titus that was with me was a Greek, they did not say that he must be circumcised. He, they did not say if he's going to be a Christian, if he's going to be a part of the church, he has to be circumcised. No, they did not. Verse 4, And that, because of false brethren unawares, brought in. There were actually false brethren in the church in Jerusalem already. Uh, just like the Judaizers that came to Galate, the Galatian churches to tell, <coughs> to tell them that they not only had to receive Christ, but that they had to keep the law. But that because of false brethren unawares brought in, 
Why did they come in? Why did these false brethren come into the church? Who came in privately, secretly, to spy on our liberty. What liberty? Our freedom, listen to me, our freedom from the law. You say, well, are, are you saying that the law has no, it doesn't mean anything today? No, I'm not. The law is just as much in effect today to convict sinners as it ever has been. There will never be a time. The Bible tells us that the law was given as our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It says in verse 24 of chapter 3, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's what the law does. The law takes that sinner. The law takes that adulterer, that drunkard, that doper, that, that prostitute, that, that child beater, that wife beater, that that sorry human being, the law takes that man and shows him by the law that he is a sinner, that he is lost, that he needs a savior. Listen to what it says in the next verse, 25 of chapter 3. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So it says... But neither Titus, who was with, with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to, to spy out our liberty, to, to check on us, to find out if we keep the law, what, what this liberty is. The liberty is our, our declaration of freedom from the law which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What bondage? They wanted to bring them back under the law. They wanted to bring them back to the place of keeping the law. Verse 5, To whom gave we gave place by subjection? No, not for an hour. Paul said, I wouldn't put up with it. He said, I didn't give them 60 minutes of my time. He said, I didn't give them any time. I would not listen to such. We are set free from the law by the grace of Christ, by the shed blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We are made free, and we are free indeed. So Paul said, I didn't even give them an hour. I didn't give them a minute. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. He said, we... <coughs> we didn't listen to them. We didn't give them a place to talk. We shut them down and sent them on their way. Verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, Paul's now going back to who he went to see. He went to see Peter and James, and I'm sure there were others there. It wasn't when they met with them, there were others there. He says, but... These who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were. Now believe me, Paul's not putting anybody down. He knows that they are the pillar of the church, that they are the strength of the church there in Jerusalem. They know that James is the head of the church, the entire church. He is, he is in the place of authority over the church there as far as mankind is concerned. Believe me, the head of the church is Jesus Christ, God's Son, and the director of the church is the Holy Spirit of God. But Paul said, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. God doesn't put one above another. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. What's he saying? They couldn't give him any more because he had already received all he needed from Christ in the desert of Arabia. Verse 7, But contrarywise, they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. I need to explain something to you. We're running out of time, and I'm having a good time teaching. I don't know about you listening, but I'm having a ball. 
I need to explain something to you about how the word circumcision is used here in Galatians and other parts of the New Testament. It's used three ways. Here, if you, if you see what he's saying, but contrary-wise, they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, well, what does he mean, the gospel of the uncircumcision? The, gen <coughs> the Gentiles. He's talking about the Gentiles. The uncircumcision is always, always the Gentiles. Remember that. But contrary-wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, God had given him the gospel to the Gentiles, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now, it's the same gospel, but Paul was going to the Gentiles and teaching and preaching and, and, and bringing the gospel to the Gentiles in the way that they could understand and receive. Peter was taking the gospel to the Jews. So when it says, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, it's talking about not the gospel that they need to be circumcised, but it's the gospel to the Jews who are circumcised that they might also hear and believe. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the Jews, the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. See here, Paul changes the words when he's talking about Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. There it's talking about the Jews. The same was mighty in me toward the uncircumcision or the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, seemed, who seemed to be pillars of the church, pillars received the grace that was given to me. <coughs> they saw that Paul was genuine. Paul was real. Paul was a sold out servant of God. Paul was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles that they might be saved. And it says, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, grace always comes first. I'm going to tell you something. Nobody ever got saved outside of grace. It's grace plus nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing you can do. Nothing I can do. Nothing anyone can do. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. So now we're, we're learning. Maybe they did shake hands back then. Glad they didn't have COVID back then. Uh, they would have been bumping elbows. But, but it says they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go into the heathen. Here again, it's very, it's very, uh, you need to understand that if you were not a Jew, in the eyes of the Jews, you are a heathen. It just simply means the Gentiles. The right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles, the heathen, and they to the circumcision. Boy, they just jump back and forth, back and forth. The circumcision is the Jews. So he says, They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they to the Jews. We to the Gentiles, they to the Jews. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. And that word forward means eager. So it would read like this. Only they would have us to remember the poor the same which I was eager to do. Paul was eager to help the poor. Matter of fact, in several places it talks about receiving money, not the tithe. It said on the first day of the week when you come together, lay in store as God has prospered you. That is not talking about the tithe. That is talking about laying in store the monies that will be used to help these poor people. And it's so strange that here, this is in Jerusalem, and, and uh, they are telling Paul to remember the poor, and when Paul received all this money and got it together, 
He took a group of men and went and took it to Jerusalem because the Christians in Jerusalem had been so persecuted, they had lost their jobs, they were hurting really bad. And they took this money to them, the same ones that said, remember the poor. They took the money to them because now they were the poor. Not spiritually poor, but financially poor. Okay, I'm going to call it off right here because we're going to start talking about Peter down in Antioch. He changes the entire subject here, so it's a good breaking place. And as I look at the clock, the clock tells me it's 1030, 1130 right now. So I hope that this has been a blessing to you. I, uh, I stutter a lot, <laughs> but I hope it's been a blessing to you and it's helped you. And, and feel free uh, to uh, message, private message me if you've got a question. For you. If you think there's something that I, I missed, something I said wrong, whatever. My name's Bill Wren. I'm on, I'm on Facebook. You can pull me up and, and, tell, and hit message and send me a message and, and, and encourage me or tell me off. I mean, whatever you want to do. Uh, I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm going to invite you to come back regardless. Father, we just thank you so much. Lord, we are so glad that you have given us the opportunity to, to teach this word. Lord, uh, it's so important that we make sure that we, we rightly divide the word and, and that we know, as Paul is trying to teach here so, so powerfully, so forcefully, that it's by grace plus nothing. Grace plus nothing. No works, no giving. No, no amount of, of striving will get you into heaven. But it's grace plus nothing. We do those things because we are saved. That we are on our way to heaven, not to get there. Father, thank you. Bless every person who has listened to this uh, Facebook Live uh, Bible Time Mobile today. Bless them, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.